pies for your lunch. Um, so right after this, we'll dismiss you. We've got uh, a smoking barbecue out there. It's going to be fantastic. Um, I, I don't generally read bios, but this one's really impressive. So if you'll bear with me, I'd like to read through this. It, you know, it's fantastic. Um, Michael Cranch, active duty U.S. Army Cyber Operations Officer, uh, with a passion for teaching, obviously, as you, as you hear this. Mm -hmm. Past three years teaching cybersecurity at West, at West Point, focused on red team operations, directed cybersecurity elective, built and taught the first offensive ethical hacking course, captured a flag, cyber defense exercise, and more recently led the curriculum development for Full Stack Cyber Academy as part of the Cyber NYC initiative. Um, published author, um, on and on, focused on cybersecurity vulnerabilities and education. So, um, well, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Now. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, um, as you can tell, I'm not from CERN, so you've been here for in this room for a little bit. Uh, I'm also not from industry, and so I really have an academic uh, uh, focus, and that's really what I want to talk to you about is uh, spending uh, almost two decades now in academia uh, trying to understand how best really to teach. And so here's the long title, uh, and you can read a little bit about it, but. But this is ultimately the question I'm trying to answer, and, and we're going to have a little bit of a discussion here from an academic perspective of how do we best teach future cybersecurity professionals. <coughs> so I'm sure all of you in here are in the industry in, in some way, right? This is uh, something we all know that we have a lot of job security, okay, in cybersecurity, uh, but we need so many more people. And in particular, we're really focused on defensive cybersecurity. Uh, even though this talk is going to be about why we should leverage offensive. 85% of those jobs out there are defensive, so we need to figure out how best to teach them. Um, and so here's where this, so what? At the end of this uh, whole presentation, here's what I hope you take away, is that offensive and defensive techniques can both be used to teach the same cybersecurity core competencies, okay? And, and that is something, using a very rigorous academic approach of going through and actually defining and, and talking about what these competencies are and showing you that we can get the same technique. So at the end of the day, we can teach the stuff we need to be a defender through an offensive means, okay? And so really the second bullet here is the, the end state of why we should use offensive technologies. It's that cybersecurity really requires resilient lifelong learners, okay? You learn something in your initial training program, whatever it is, whether it's academic or through industry certifications, you're gonna go out on the job and you're gonna be expected to continue to learn throughout your entire career. And actually, you have to, right? The, the tools are updating, the techniques that are being used. So we need to build people that are really passionate, that want to do things like attend B-Side on the weekend. Uh, and, and to do that, we need to create these resilient, lifelong learners. And at the end of the day, offensive techniques are best for doing that, for building that passion. And then by combining this focus on concepts with the relevant training of industry certifications and, and some of the motivational techniques we'll talk about through gamification, we really can build this best uh, training platform, okay? And so for my motivation, uh, we talked about cyber defense. So I got into this when I was in my undergraduate. Uh, so I participated in a uh, CDX uh, at West Point uh, in 2005, right? So here's the headline, the NSA attacks West Point for lack of just a cyber war game. So we had this competition where we spent uh, about three months just building an enterprise network, okay? So we went through and built all the things that are in an enterprise network, your Exchange, Active Directory, your uh, web services, DNS, all this time going through our checklists and the playbooks and establishing our procedures for what happened, then we start this competition, it's a week long, really four days, and you know, day one, everything's going all right. Day two, you know, they've moved a little bit past your scanning, and then like, Day three, everything's on fire, right? You know, we did, we did all of this work for months to get to this point, and it's just, you know, they, they, at the end of the day, we won the competition, but I didn't feel, leave this experience in feeling like I, I won as a defender. I had uh, the adversary all over my network, and so I kind of walked away from that experience a little bit disheartened. Um, uh, and so I went off to do communications and went into the other security things as an officer. Then I got a chance to go back to Princeton, really study graduate level cybersecurity, get into uh, a little bit more of it. And I came back and I started teaching cybersecurity. 
And I joined uh, the cyber team I have there, which is doing capture the flag exercise. And so I kind of hope you uh, all have some understanding of capture the flag <coughs> and what takes place at DEF CON and that there's a lot of collegiate level. And so there's, there's some difference here, and it's not just the mood lighting and the <laughs> cool stickers and all the energy drinks, right? So my first competition there uh, that I, I did with them, um, I believe, was uh, the Boston Tea Party in, in the fall. Uh, or plaid, one of those two. But anyways, it's a, a really a high level, even though these are collegiate, high level capture of flag. And so these students, they spent all weekend working on one problem, the problem that was already solved by the majority of, of people in this competition. And they're just sitting there, and they're working on it. And you know, it's a 48 hour competition at two o'clock on, on Sunday, right? Three hours before they, they solved their first problem and they're all like cheering everyone. It's super exciting. We finished in like 193rd place, right? <laughs> and, but they're still super excited that they went through this experience. And I kind of think back to my experience with CDX and I'm like, oh, this is interesting, right? And so then I got to go from there and um, in, in the spring they actually asked me to be one of the coaches of the CDX. And so I was like, okay, now I can start. And then to get an experience for what it was like now, they sent me to go be part of the red team. And so I could see from the other side what the adversary was, and the next year I'd come back and teach. And so here's uh, me with the red team during this. And of course, they got the cool pirate flag, right? And the, uh, the EDM going on. Uh, <laughs> and so all of this, but what I noticed there is my expectation was that I'd walk in and they're just sitting there and they just, boop, press the easy button. They've owned the networks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't like that. And they actually had a very similar experience to what the cadets uh, experience, right? They spent three months building these images, right? Installing the roof kits and the back doors and intentionally weakening the, the security features and there was multiple operating systems they had to do and all of this infrastructure before they give it out to the students that are participating, right? And at the start of the competition, the students are actually pretty good at defense. I mean, they had a lot of time, right, to do this but they spent all the time working on these, these uh, uh, callbacks, right? And they, they turn it on and nothing's calling them back, right? And so they're sitting there and they're trying to figure out, well, are they just blocking the outbound communication method? Maybe I can still send commands in and get them through that and have this whole troubleshooting process of trying to figure out what the network actually looks like, what security the, the students have implemented. And I mean, they're sitting there struggling, like day one. It's not that we didn't see anything because they weren't doing anything, right? They're really having a hard time trying to figure out what's going on. Like day two, a little bit more, and then day day three, right? 48 hours, they start to make this breakthrough, right? And and uh, they start to use that to be able to pivot throughout the network, uh, the modifying. And so it was a difficult, resilient process here that the red team had to go through. Very different than what I expected. And then I go back, right? And now I'm a coach. And it was exactly like I was as a student, right? I mean, they're sitting there. They have more advanced techniques now. I mean, they're using Elasticsearch, and we have Logstash, and Kibana, and, and we have these like custom tools that will detect and kill processes. But still, the same checklist kind of uh, thing. The students still get very frustrated because they're going to get owned. They have to, right? Kind of for the, the competition to, to make sense. Uh, we can't just sit there and do nothing. And that's even part of it. A lot of it is just kind of waiting as a defense. And so this really left me with these two questions. Does offensive techniques really establish a better mindset, particularly this resilience, this passion for cybersecurity uh, compared to defensive techniques? And then can I teach the same things with both offensive and defensive techniques, right? The, the same skill sets. And I'll say that this is not entirely original. Other people have had <laughs> these same two thoughts, right? I'm sure if you've been in the, the field at all, I mean, Bruce Schneider first started talking about the, the security mindset back in the early 2000s. There's been great debates on CTFs versus CDX from uh, people like Chris Eagle or even Tyler Mansquire uh, in the early uh, 2010s. But when I started to look about this, People write a lot about this, but no one's actually done anything to say, are these the same techniques? What are the, the, the concepts we're supposed to be learning? What is actually the impact of these two methods? And so that's really what the rest of this is about, is trying to formalize this to make it less of just, I write a blog post because I'm an expert and you believe what I say, right? So what can we do to actually prove 
one of these things is true. So here are my three questions that we're going to answer here, right? So what are the core skills that a person who shows up day one in cybersecurity, I'm on a new job, what do you expect that person to already know, right? Do offensive and defensive techniques then teach those skills that we're going to define, and then does the method of teaching those techniques actually make a difference? Doesn't matter at all, and so we're going to have to break through these three. So the first one here is, what are cybersecurity's core concepts? Um, so first thing I gotta kind of define is what are the core concepts? And again, I already told you, when you have someone show up the first day, that's what I expect them to already know. There's many terms that are basically a synonymous fundamental knowledge, essential skills, and they really have three components. First, we talked about this, they have to be timeless. I can't just teach a single tool uh, because that's not necessarily going to be relevant in the future. They have to be not tied to current technology, right? It has to be something that can be applied more broadly. And then, most specifically, these are the concepts that are the hardest, to, that provide the greatest barrier to entry into the profession of future masters. So those are the things we're going to try and tackle so that they can continue to progress. They can specialize in whatever uh, method they want as they go throughout and have a successful career. And so we'll play a little game here, right? So is this a core cybersecurity concept? Yes. yes. OK, everyone's pretty much in agreement. How about programming and scripting? Yes. yes. OK. How about yes. digital forensics? Yeah, okay. Okay. How about malware analysis? Yes. Oh, all right. Okay. So here we go. Vulnerability assessment. Yes. Okay. That's good. I, I like to see that there. How about reporting? Yes. yes. Okay. Right. This this is an industry. Uh, students hate reporting. Right. They would definitely say no. Uh, command line tools. Yes. Oh wow. That's probably louder than networking. How about enjoying tasty beverages? Yes. Okay, right, so maybe not so much, but uh, you can see even in here we have some slightly different opinions, right, and I'm trying to stay away from that. So at the end of the day, uh, two talks ago they talked a lot about frameworks. There's a lot of frameworks out there that kind of solve this problem that come out, particularly in the past two years, which is awesome timing for me to do this. So we have NICE, uh, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of and, and used they have their workforce framework as well as their cybersecurity. We're going to talk about CSAC 2017 and then CATS. And so the first one here is the NICE. Um, you, you've probably seen this suite, uh, you know, little circle with the five parts, uh, the cybersecurity framework. They also have this whole workforce framework where they split everything down now into 53 different work roles and they list the skills required for each of those 53 separate work roles. What they don't do, though, is they do not establish these core skills, right? And I tried, and I'm still working on this, and there's uh, some more that needs to be done, but trying to pull, tease out of that what are most common and, and use that a little more. But they don't just establish, they focus, you have to pick your specialty, and then based on your specialty, here are the skills you need to do. So um, that wasn't particularly useful in this case. The next one is the Cybersecurity Curricula 2018. And this is a huge <coughs> project. 300 plus experts, 35 countries, ACM, IEEE, AIS, and so these are really big names in the computing space. So this is, when you talk about a degree, when I say I have a computer science degree, most of you have some idea in your brain what that means, right? You kind of think of the skills that I would know as a computer scientist. There's a lot of trouble with this with IT, right? If you think about it, I have an IT degree back in the early 2000s, what do I actually know? Right, it wasn't standardized, and now we kind of have some expectation of what a, an IT degree was. So they have come out since 2017 and said, here are the things, if you graduate with a computer, uh, a cybersecurity uh, degree, here are the skills that you, that this person will have. They have these eight knowledge areas, and what's most important here is that they define the essential concepts in each of these knowledge areas. Okay, so now I have this pool of essential concepts that I can use and kind of uh, uh, test against. Okay, so here is an example of some of the skills uh, just from three of the eight knowledge areas. There's about um, 50, I think it's 54 <coughs> total. And so things like vulnerability of system components we talked about, reverse engineering being on here, attack, authentication, uh, access control, confidentiality, integrity, those things that, that you would expect. And so they go and define, and they go even further and actually say the learning outcomes 
you should get from each of these sub uh, concepts. So this is a great starting point. Uh, they also mentioned documentation, right? We, we talked about reporting, and uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. And then CATS, again, it's another collaborative process. A lot of experts, they use a Delphi process, which if it means something to you, uh, that's good. I'm not going to explain it, but just a way of vetting this. And they come out with two main uh, tools. <coughs> Cybersecurity concept inventory, which is what you should expect after your first like training course or after your first semester, uh, really, of uh, cybersecurity. And then the curriculum assessment, which is what you should have when entering the workforce. And here's an example. And so these are rated by importance. And so that's the panel. When they came through this process, everyone rates it. And then they take the ones that are most important, and that's what they use in the tool, as well as the difficulty, the barrier to learning. And you can see some of the same things, identifying vulnerability, identify your security goals, explain why a failure happens. So these are the types of things that they would establish as the core competencies that someone graduating. So now I have this baseline of skills. Okay, So now i got to look at different training techniques and see what are the actual skills you learn from those training techniques. Okay, so this really has a problem here. It's how do I know if something is offensive or defensive, right? So I need to classify something to be able to assess what I just talked about. Again, so we have something here, reverse engineering, offensive or defensive? Both. Defense. Both, okay, right, you know, so how about connection attempts? Both. Offense. Offense, both, okay. How? Uh, I thought I had one more, but we could go through, right, and, and go through these, and a lot of opinion again. We're trying to get this opinion out of there, and so how do I actually classify a resource? Well, one of the best ways to classify a resource is to use industry's own classification, right? Um, so SAMS, uh, Offensive Security, a lot of these institutions specifically say, if you're a defender, here's a defender's course. If you're a red team, here's a red team course. And so what we can do is we can use their own industry standard classification, look at the skills they teach, and then classify them either as offensive, defensive, or both. There's also this whole taxonomy presented to do this on public resources. And so what I did was I went through all of these skills, right? I went through all of these syllabuses. I had some other people that were helping me with it. And here's the list of resources. Public CTFs, security training, and this is all really focused on that introductory, that like 500 level uh, kind of courses. And so here's an example, right? SANS, blue, red. I mean, so I can look at the skills taught here in these courses and the, the labs they do in the training and I can compare it to here and that's how I can classify it. And so now I have this classification. And at the end of the day, if you're uh, in education, you understand Bloom's taxonomy. And so a lot of this stuff's down here at the knowledge or comprehension level. What's really cool is particularly with the way they do challenges, you need to have troubleshooting or problem solving, which is really teaching you or assessing you at a much higher level than what is required. And this is really what we, uh, when we're trying to actually do red team or blue team operations, we're at the application, the analysis, the synthesis level. So it's great that they're already above what we need. Okay, so what were the results of all of this? So here's a lot of numbers. Okay, so I'm going to break this down one category at a time. Uh, instead of, so first we have the core concepts. So here's how many actual concepts there were total, 135 of them. Assess concepts, so things like documentation. I, I showed you that. That really can be taught either way. So there's not like, you know, or, or reporting, public speaking was in here, uh, teamwork. Right? So I kind of took a lot of those more social things and I just didn't really assess them because that wasn't so much the manner of teaching, that's how you decided to teach it itself or uh, establish the classroom. Um, so now here's the actual results, right? So when we talk about taught by both, taught by offensive only or defensive, you can see offensive techniques end up covering 89% of the concepts here. Defensive techniques cover 95%. Right, so there is a little bit better on the defensive side, but both of them is really the vast majority of these concepts. And in either case, there are some concepts that you're gonna to have to leverage the other one for. And then we looked here at this idea of primarily offensive or primarily defensive. And so even though I, we, we kind of have this, yeah, it's quasi both, some of those really, really were more offensive. You know, vulnerability assessment, uh, explaining how to exploit traffic analysis. Those are both, but really more offensive things. 
And then you could look at things like um, monitoring, given a breach, explaining how to recover it, uh, uh, more of your defensive. And so you can see, even though right here, the defensive, it covers more, more of those are actually a little more offensive. And so at the end of the day, here's the conclusion, right? Is that either technique can be used to teach the majority of these concepts, okay? And so now, does it actually matter? Does it matter how we teach? And so this is where we get into that little bit more of that uh, uh, psychological analysis. And so what is the psychological uh, outcome? What we're looking for is that idea of lifelong learners. We want people that are resilient. We want to build this intrinsic motivation, which is this idea that you motivate yourself from the inside, right? That you want to do things like go to conferences like this or go uh, hack and do CPS on, on the weekend. Uh, growth mindset, does anyone here have kids? Okay, right, so growth mindset is this huge thing on how we're supposed to uh, teach kids this idea of praising failure, praising effort versus simply praising the A, right? And this idea of getting them to be resilient and to continue to learn and struggle through things. Uh, we also have really this resilience. And how do you build resilience? It's by facing, failing, and then overcoming a moderate challenge, right? It can't be too easy because it doesn't mean anything to you. It can't be too hard that you stop, right? You've got to have that medium challenge. And there's actually physical effects, dopamine releases, that starts to get you to want to do this more, right? And so when we look at offense, it's got a lot of these positive attributes built into it. There's already this idea, this mantra, if you see down there in offensive security, of that this is supposed to be hard, right? You're supposed to fail. You're going to try things repeatedly. Even the same exploit when you send it across the target, I mean, sometimes it doesn't work, right? Because of the, the, what's going on in memory and, and how the, uh, the exploit is, is structured. And so, and we also, I mentioned before, have this idea of the security mindset, that, that you really need to think about how things can be made to fail to be able to identify the vulnerability <coughs> versus just simply think about how they're made. The expectation to fail often, and then, of course, this repeat small victories. And when we start to look at defensive uh, impact, uh, there's several things here. But at the end of the day, the defensive defender either sets things up and just wins, right, which there's really no challenge, or they lose because someone breaks in. And so part of it is the mindset of how do we better build this, someone gets in and I, I work them out method into defensive training, but it just doesn't have the same positive impact of uh, the offensive training. And it's not as exciting, right? I and mean, then you can see that just when it's about all the discussions even here, we had uh, Tim Medine talking earlier about how to bring more red teaming into blue teaming. And so it's just not as impactful. And so at the end of the day, offensive techniques really get people more excited about cybersecurity. They're the best for building resilience and this intrinsic motivation, getting them to be part of the community. And these are things that we need to build in cybersecurity. So I have about three minutes left. And so how do you actually build offensive training? Right? And that's the uh, the next question. So I offensive curriculum is hard. And it has several really unique challenges. We talk about things like you need this infrastructure. You need these repeatedly breakable machines that you can maintain and keep fixing, right? At the end of the day, people are going to get full access to your machine. Right? And then there's legal and networking issues sometimes associated with this. <coughs> Particularly if you're talking about doing this inside your own organization, right? I'm teaching college students how to hack. And then what happens if they go do this somewhere else, right? So there's, there's all these kind of external things that we have to worry about. Um, and so leverage industry, right? We have a lot of industry that's already doing this out there. Uh, and now even these are somewhat expensive uh, solutions. We ended up using PWK over there because we can do it at our own pace at home. It has the whole infrastructure. But there's cheaper solutions out there if you, if you can't afford it. Uh, PWK, right? You can go to Bone Hub. There's places where you can get machines already established or hack the box, right? It's like $19 a month. Uh, so there, there's other places that you can go and get access to this. And then 
that talks a little more about this. But So I started two purely offensive courses in here. And the real key is to start to build in these things I talked about, this failure and then winning, these gamification, this idea of having my students compete against each other, build sweet scoreboards, right, where they track their progress against each other the whole time. They get achievements as they go. The other thing is letting it be self-paced. So in the classroom, instead of focusing on how they do a technique, right, I can sit there and talk to them about why did you choose that technique, right? What is the underlying concept, right? Uh, one of the things they always struggle with is this idea of tunneling. So when you get into tunneling, you start to peel that back and like, what's happening? You're using a TCP connection. So what kind of things can't you send across TCP, like ping, right? That's why that doesn't work. Uh, and so you can start to have these deeper. And you can see my students here, we're clearly competing against each other. You can see the lines at Sunday, midnight, right? Everyone's <laughs> throwing their submissions. We gave bonuses at that point. Uh, and they're way above, the, the red here is what was required. They're way above it because they're competing against each other. And then I have this idea of, uh, here's the later lab completion. Um, I built teams, and so they had to work together to build teams, and you can see that we actually had each team win an even amount of time, because they took a lot of pride. We had first bloods, all of these different techniques in here. Uh, the last thing is we actually had a live performance-based exam. Okay, so everyone sat there, I had a bunch of new machines, and they got to compromise these with Twitch. You know, everyone had their own like keyboard screen, uh, streaming, and we had the scoreboard, and everyone wins, right? Everyone defeated, right, pwned at least one machine. So even the person that ended up getting the lowest score still felt like, I couldn't do this before the class. I've done all of this now. I had this public display. And it was really an exciting, uh, inspirational event, right? And so the end state is this gamification aspect really works. I uh, provide a lot of this extra motivation that builds the passion, right? The class format, this letting them go at their own place provides a deeper understanding. And then you got to internalize this security mindset. So here's the overall ball. So what? Um, thank you so much uh, for your time. Does anyone have any questions? There's barbecue waiting. <laughs> <laughs>